Thank you so much for joining us here for the next hour as uh, we're going to be answering your Bible questions, uh, any questions you have on the Christian faith. 888-712-7434, 888-712-7434. If you just tuned in for the very first time, this is a, a live call-in program. Uh, Pastor Lloyd Pooley and myself, we're uh, basically answering your Bible questions. Any Any question you have, on the Christian faith, you can just call us at 888-712-7434 is the number. Uh, on Mondays, Pastor Lloyd comes in to us remotely. And so either uh, I'm here live in the studio and I, and I, you know, for those of you watching on Facebook and YouTube, uh, Pastor Lloyd is coming to us uh, another way. And so, uh, Pastor Lloyd, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm in studio, but remotely. Yes, you are. And you know, it's interesting here. We are in March and we're approaching a very, very big, big day coming up here. Good Friday, Easter Sunday. And uh, boy, what, what what an incredible year we've had. A lot of tough things have happened. And Pastor Lloyd, as a pastor, what, what's your heart's desire to really see uh, this Easter in the, in the lives of believers? Listen, this is a, I mean, this week represents like a, a year ago, we did not have any clue what mm. this coming year was going to be about. And um, this whole year has been a whirlwind of what do we do, what do we do? And, and everybody's in the same boat. The difference is when you can come to a foundation and a rock and the truth of what God has said, nothing moves you at that point. You, you understand that God is working his purposes, and so you, in the midst of it, instead of getting so frustrated and anger or depressed or anxious to take all that to God. And from his word, you get a clarity and a picture that, I mean, look, it, the, the world has always been through convolutions and challenges. I mean, our brothers and sisters in China, uh, they're getting affected a lot more than we can even fathom uh, compared to us. Yet they're thriving because their root and their trust is in God's word uh, what they can get a hold of it, they treasure. And when we smuggle Bibles in there, you know, it's amazing the response we get back. So that's, and of course, no one's going to know how we do that because that would be obviously stopped. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, we've seen the Lord do amazing things through his word here in America and abroad, and I would encourage people get back to the scriptures. Absolutely. And w what an incredible time. I mean, w what a perfect time, Pastor Lloyd, to... We, we know we have there are a lot of people without hope right now because of the political arena, the the, the pandemic, and, and here we're approaching this big day for us to to use to to share the gospel with people about what Jesus did on the cross for them. You know, this is uh, this is what it's really about. Um, it's the cross. It's we have the most amazing thing where our King, our Messiah, our uh, the Son of God, put His life on the line on the cross, a cruel death. And, and the question is, why do we call it Good Friday? Because that sacrifice, that full sacrifice that we would have had to pay was paid in full for us. And, of course, the resurrection, uh, you know, verified that that payment was accepted so that we know uh, he didn't just die and, gee, we hope it worked out. No, we can know from the resurrection. Amen. All right. If you just tuned in, this is Bridge Bible Talk. I'm Robert Baltadano and uh, Pastor Lloyd Pooley coming to us remotely. And uh, we're here for the hour to answer any Bible question you have. It, perhaps you have a question on on the uh, the crucifixion of Christ, uh, Easter coming up, and and perhaps you are getting questions from your skeptical neighbors or your uh, you know perhaps maybe it's a, a coworker. Uh, give us a call with those questions, and we'll be happy to help you in any way we can as we point to you back to the Bible. Uh, 888-712-7434, 888-712-7434. If you're watching on Facebook and on YouTube, you can participate in the program by posting your question in the comment section. Uh, we do have someone watching over those two areas, and they'll send those questions in to us. And uh, we do have questions that have come in as well through uh, the questions at bbtlive.org. That's our email address. And so we're going to begin with uh, questions there right now, since we have uh, many that come in. Uh, the first question that we have here, and this is from Kevin. Uh, he really has three questions, but we'll see what we can get through here. But the first one is in Exodus chapter 7 through 9. And his question is this, Pastor Lloyd. Uh, there were plagues sent to, to the Egyptians for not letting the Israelites go worship God. And uh, were the Hebrews afflicted by the plagues or only the Egyptians? So I guess his first question is, was that the reason why... Uh, you know, God sent the plagues to the Egyptians because they did not let the people go. Well, that's exactly. I mean, God God ordained that 
you know, he was going to bring his people out from under their plagues or their, their, their persecutions and bring them into the promised land as he promised he would. So, you know, the, the Egyptians, of course, would have none of that. And after Joseph was kind of no longer known who he was because he was a hero, he saved Egypt and mm-hmm. they should have had great thanks uh, to him. But a new dynasty established, new political leadership, not recognizing Israel, and they became afraid of Israel and essentially put them under great persecution and affliction. And and Moses, even in his early days, you know, rescued by God uh, from being killed uh, by being a male born uh, among the Hebrews and raised by Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, and then, of course, come and it came into his mind who he was. And he thought, OK, God's going to use me now. I'm going to I'm going to deliver my people and ended up killing one Egyptian, had to run, had to run for his life. Uh, so he's 40 years in the wilderness uh, with uh, God, you know, dealing with him. And then the Lord brings him back. Now, when he comes back, of course, he has the plan where God is going to bring a deliverance. So, but he's told that Pharaoh won't have anything to do with it, but there'll be signs and plagues that will come upon the Egyptians. Eventually they'll let them go. So that's essentially what happened. Now in the, in the beginning, you know, it looks like uh, up to, up to the uh, third or through the third plague by the fourth plague, it says uh, that now this didn't come in the area of Goshen where Israel was. It seems to imply that they might have encountered the first three plagues, but there's no evidence of that, and I don't think that would have been the meaning of that. So I don't think they were affected by the plagues. I think they were protected. Of course, the last one, if they didn't put the blood on the doorpost, then they would have been affected by that if they didn't believe God and trust in the blood that he was providing. Right, and I think the, the, the whole point there, and even the, even the, the obviously the key in that scripture, especially with the first question he asked about not letting the Israelites go. Uh, I mean, could you imagine just as you look and think about the story that Moses came out of the Egyptian, you know, obviously from that life, and yet, uh, what, uh, 40 years later, God wants him to go back. I mean, that must have been a tough challenge to him to go back to somewhere that he left and fled. Well, the only way we could ever, you know, quantify that in our own life is when you encounter and you taste and see the, the God of the Bible, you know, all things are possible at that point. You realize it's not about you. But Mo- Moses had some issues just like any of us would. You know, like, send, yeah. send somebody else. I can't even talk. I mean, he was once very eloquent, could lead strongly. But 40 years leading sheep in the wilderness, he kind of, you know, got emptied. And that's mm-hmm. exactly what God intended. Mm-hmm. Before the Lord can use us, sometimes he has to empty us. Amen. Amen. All right. 888-712-7434. Uh, that was your question, Kevin. I know you have two other questions and we'll come back to the other two, uh, but uh, we're going to be taking our first call here. So this is Bridge Bible Talk. 888-712-7434 is the number. Let's go out to Gene in New York. Gene, are you there? I am here. Hi. Thanks for having me, guys. You're welcome. What's your question for today? My question is... Uh... I'm a Roman Catholic, and I've been more and more being pulled more and more towards the Calvary Chapel. I love it. Thank you, guys. Um, I, I noticed that you don't celebrate, or it seems like you don't uh, talk about getting ashes on Ash Wednesday. Can you explain um, why you feel the Catholics do this and why you don't? Yeah, good question, Gene. Pastor Lloyd, why, why don't we celebrate Ash Wednesday, or, or, or should we? Well, that's... Um... You know, that is a tradition that people have. You know, you go you go back into kind of this picture of trying to lead people up to understand, you know, that the the, the day of crucifixion is coming and it's kind of like a period of Lent and uh, it starts off with this idea of just humility. So, I mean, it has some good features of humility and uh, and that sort of thing. But but the reality is. You know, a lot of traditions are not the same as what the Bible has to say. There's nothing really in the Bible that would guide us in any of those traditions. They're just they're traditions and they're not like necessarily bad. Um, it's just that we really try to stick as much as we can to a biblical text rather than traditions. And we try to refrain as much as we can, even at Calvary Chapel. Let's not start our own new tra- traditions that almost get equated with the the directions from God in the Bible. So, now you came, uh, Robert. You probably could speak more to this. Uh, did you? Co- you came out of a, a background yes, of Catholicism. I, yes, I, I did. And I think one of the things that um, now being a, a born again Christian, Gene, as, as Pastor Lloyd is mentioning here about you know why we don't celebrate in in the way that you know Roman Catholics do. 
you know, what I've learned is as now, you know, following Christ and sticking to what the Bible says, the Bible nowhere really explicitly commands um, or even condemns a practice of Christians, you know, doing this. Uh, but if, 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 say, if we decided to observe Ash Wednesday or, or Lent, I think it's important, at least for, for us to look at it from a biblical perspective. You know, Jesus warned against making a show of our fasting, which is one of the things I think when it comes to Ash Wednesday, you put the ashes on your forehead so others see what you've done. And I think we've been warned about that in the sense that we don't want to show that off. Um, you know, obviously, it's a good thing to repent of sinful activities, uh, but I think that's uh, something that as Christians we're to do every day and not just once a year when it comes to Lent or during this time. So that, that's the way I learned and I kind of got out of that. So um, I don't know. Does, does that help you out a little bit, Gene? Sure. It does make me understand your thought process on it and uh, the, your church's uh, views. Um, I thank you very much for your time, guys. You're you are welcome. Thank we you, Gene. appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, you know what? You know, the, and I think yeah, more and more in these this time that we live in is 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 uh, along those lines. You know, we are getting to a place where the church is going to be more persecuted. So, those that might put a visible display of their devotion to God wouldn't wouldn't necessarily uh, result in people praising them. It would might result in more persecution. So, I I applaud anybody who takes a visible and strong stand for the gospel. But again, you know, sometimes traditions can be, we just have to put them in their right place. Uh, right. So again, the Lord knows the heart exactly. and the motivation of why someone would follow this. It's just, it's an extra biblical thing and, and it's okay as long as it's not against the Bible. And I don't see anything in the celebration of Lent in the sense of a self-denial, you know, fasting and focusing on spiritual disciplines and looking forward to the coming, you know, time to celebrate his death and resurrection. I mean, who, who could argue that that is a problem? That's not a problem. Exactly. And and I think, too, it's good to remember that no ritual can make one's heart right with God uh, because you're doing this ritual that, um, that that's changing heart. Because, again, when I was a Roman Catholic, I went through all these, uh, you know, motions, uh, and, and, but it, my heart never changed. You know, I, I was still yeah, a if, sinner. If you're trusting them, that's exactly right. The, the, they might... They might be a nice tradition to do. Uh, it's kind of like if Christians are celebrating Christmas and they decorate a tree. Some people have a hard time with all of the, you know, gifts and, and kind of ob obscuring the fact of the incarnation of Jesus. But, you know, there's our American traditions. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with them. As long as you're not worshiping the tree and you're forgetting Christ, then then no problem. Amen. All right. All right. This is Bridge Bible Talk. This is Robert Baltadano. And uh, Pastor Lloyd Pooley is coming to us remotely. We're here to answer any Bible question you have. Any question you have on the Christian faith, the number to call is 888-712-7434, 888-712-7434. Any question you have pertaining to the Bible, uh, the Christian walk, uh, if you have a question perhaps of a situation you're in and you're looking for a biblical perspective, uh, well, give us a call right now, 888-712-7434. Uh, we did get a call in here, Pastor Lloyd. Um, Lindsay called and from central New Jersey. She did not want to go on the air, but she wanted us some clarification when it comes to women in leadership and uh, she has first corinthians fourteen thirty three, which says for god is not the author of confusion but of peace as is all the churches of the saints and cross-referenced it to uh first timothy chapter 2 uh verse 12 and uh which which i'll read that as well for the sake of context uh second timothy chapter 2 verse 12 says this uh, if we endure we shall also reign with him if we deny him, he will also deny us. So I guess her question is, and, and I wish she was on the line to kind of get more information, but um, what is our thought on women in leadership? And she gave us those two verses to shed some wisdom. I think she might just be off on the verses maybe because uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 is where the Lord commands, let your women keep oh. silent in the churches okay. for they're not permitted to speak for they're to be submissive uh, as the law also says. And if they want to learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home for it's shameful for women to speak in church. Yeah. Boy, I, I wish I had a dollar for every time someone <laughs> asked me about that question. <laughs> and, and it really does come up a lot. And again, you know, in the second Timothy passage, you know, it's clear or first Timothy passage, it's clear in chapter two that he's speaking about the leadership in the church and that this is to be a role that men are to play and to be the husband of one wife and the women are not to exercise authority in that regard in the church. So it comes up about women pastors all the time. 
you know, the reality is that we, we live in a culture where a lot of men have stepped out of the, the arena and, and women have filled those gaps mm -hmm. and very capable, very, you know, spiritual, very grounded women. Uh, but nonetheless, it's really a sign that, that Timoth Timothy, Paul says, his message to Timothy goes back to the beginning of creation. And I, and I keep coming back to that as much as it's not culturally acceptable and it seems like, you know, we are, uh, you know, the church is holding women back. The reality is God has a role, the complementary role for each male and female. And of course, right now, the culture is getting confused overall in regard to gender and even uh, codifying that in the law, sadly, uh, which one day will come back and hit us all. But, you know, we'll be persecuted because we are going to hold what the scriptures say. But the reality is when he goes to the Corinthian uh, passage, which seems very like, you know, women keep silent and it's shameful for them to speak in church as if, you know, women couldn't fellowship in church or open their mouth. I mean, that is taken way out of context. He's referring particularly to two or three prophets and, and speakers of the word communicating and everybody then taking the time to evaluate and testing what's being said. What do you test it with? With the word of God. The problem in Corinth was a lot of women had got discovered this newfound freedom now that there's no distinction between male and female, Jew and Greek. We're one in Christ, and this was wonderful. I mean, it, it freed women. It was basically women's liberation from the Bible. But what happened is then they would go too far. They started intruding in some of the areas where men are supposed to lead, and that's why Paul in both places basically says, no, you've got to put a cap on that and understand each has a role. And finding our lane, you know, and even as a pastor, I mean, I can get pulled into other lanes of ministry. I can I can get tempted, maybe I'm not called to do. The reality is I want to find what it is the Lord wants for me to do. And so, uh, but that question comes up a lot. And I think what we'll have to do is archive all of the times we've answered that question and just refer to that. That is a good, yep, exactly. That's a good idea. Um, and, uh, you know, we've answered, yeah, many times we've answered this question. But, uh, you know, the good thing is that, you know, people that call in, we had a caller last week who just happened to be driving, I believe it was through Brooklyn, New York, and happened to just find us on the radio and uh, called us right away. I think it was Friday, actually. And it was really neat to see that, that, uh, you know, people are jumping on the program fresh and brand new. So I think that would be a good thing to have an archive to say when somebody calls in with a question, we could say, hey, by the way, you know, go to this date. You know, that answer, that question was answered. Uh, Pastor Lloyd, we're going to answer. Let's go to another question that we have here from our email address. Um, Patrick from uh, Dorchester, Massachusetts, uh, sent us a question. Actually, let's back up. Let's do Sandro. I, I skipped him. I want to kind of do this uh, according to the, the way they come in. But Okay. Uh, another question that, that we get a lot here is, is the book of Jude. And his question is, uh, Jude, the brother of Jesus, and James quoted Enoch in Jude chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. If the book of Enoch was left out of the Bible, why did he quote Enoch? And, and, and a lot of that goes al along with, you know, is the book of Enoch considered the Bible? And maybe it was left out purposely. Uh, the reality is Jude's quote is not the only quote uh, in the Bible from a non-biblical source. The Apostle Paul quotes in Titus 1, 12, this, uh, the poet Epimedides. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, doesn't mean that the quote is, okay, that this guy spoke in the word of God, but in the context of how he quotes it, he's making a point. The same thing is with true with Jude. Jude is quoting uh, from the book of Enoch. It doesn't indicate the entire book of Enoch is inspired or even true. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a lot of tradition. By the way, Enoch didn't write the book. It was written sometime between 200 and 300 before Christ, uh, B.C. B so it was before Jude wrote, and it did compile some of the oral traditions about Enoch and what he might have said. Jude picks up one in that one verse that is certainly, you know, part of what he expressed. And, you know, what you know, what you know is this, though. If you actually read the book of Enoch, uh, it is weird. I mean, it is way off there. I mean, it basically describes some of the the oral tradition that came down of how the angels kind of mated with the children of, you know, the daughters of men, and there came these, um, you know, hybrid creatures. But in Enoch, it says they were 450 foot tall. So it says a lot of weird stuff, mm -hmm. and a lot of it is mumbo jumbo, and typical of, you know, uh, what I would call pseudo. Uh, uh, 
epigraphal writings where they're, they have a name that it's the actual author, but it's not. And it wasn't accepted by the Jewish people by any stretch. And by Jude quoting it didn't discredit him in his day because they knew that oral tradition was true. They just didn't accept that guy who put all those other things in it. And so that's the idea. Everything has to be tested on its own, and you test the scriptures. But it only takes about 30 seconds to recognize that book is way off. Um, all kind, No Jewish scholar, again, would give it credence. And, and you know, Jude just quoting from that portion would not have been a problem since the tr that part of the tradition was accepted. Yeah, and I think to treating any books outside of the Bible, that the 66 books we have, you have to treat them as fallible historical documents, not as inspired authority, uh, authoritative word of God. And I think that's where people get stuck. I had a, a friend or one of my, the guys that I pastored at church many years ago. He would, when I was going through the book of Revelation, he would actually be going through the book of Enoch and he would come to me afterwards and uh, he said, Hey, what you said here, look at this. And, and I would try to gently tell him, Hey, don't, don't, don't look at this book to try to interpret Revelation. You're going to get warped, you know, with that. Yeah, it's the other way around. Exactly. You know, the Bible should always test everything else. And, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, apocryphal books that have some good history in them, have some good points, some interesting sayings, but they're also mixed with a lot of, you know, strange traditions. Absolutely. Like some, some of them have Jesus making little, you know, paper uh, birds and then blowing on them and they, they turn into real birds and, <laughs> you know, all these kind of strange things that get mixed in. Yeah, yeah. That, just stick with your Bible. Amen. And uh, one last thing, Sandro did mention something at the end of his question. He said that um, there's so many questions and sometimes it leads him to depression because of lack of answers. Now, what would you say to that, Pastor Lloyd? Well, again, you know, listen, you could watch the History Channel and come up with the same thing. I mean, the way they uh, twist the uh, the accounts that are given to us in the Scripture with supposed historical accounts of various things. You you doubt that Israel even was uh, slaves enslaved in Egypt. You doubt that they even came out with a great, you know, uh, deliverance. You doubt Moses. You doubt the stories of the Bible, and they they compare them with all these other myths of the pagans. And the reality is, it's how it's twistedly it's put. You know, people don't realize that. The, the basis for the scriptures is so strong and, you know, that kind of is suppressed in favor of, in the last hundred years, all the skepticism that has come out, to, uh, you know, basically challenging everything, uh, including creation, including the narrative of, of Genesis 1 through 11. And I think people ha should not get intimidated. You know, I, listen, I was uh, this way, I was deceived by the idea of that we were seated by aliens back when I was in high school. And it, it became an interesting, you know, way for me to reject the Bible and get away from church and kind of decide I didn't believe in God. And eventually, you know, the Lord mercifully, through prayer, uh, got my attention as I was in my rebellion and came back to that relationship with him. And, you know, it's, the funny thing is there's a lot of evidence for the Bible, but the most powerful one for me is when you have a personal acquaintance with the author, you kind of know this is your shepherd speaking. My sheep will hear my voice and follow me. And you know the voice of the shepherd. And the Bible stands so far above any other writing. And I think people just need to be encouraged. Don't be intimidated. Mm -hmm. uh, hold on. If you have a question, that's what some of the leaders told me when I was a young Christian. Don't get, like, freaked out about something that's told you. You know, have the question, write it down, and then we'll do some research and we'll see where it comes from. So for uh, Sandro, I'd encourage him, look, at this point, you know, if you have some questions, write them down. You could send them to us. We will address them because you'll have the same questions many others going through the scriptures. Amen. And uh, there's sometimes, Pastor Lloyd, and you know this, we've mentioned this before, sometimes there's no answers. We don't have an answer to certain uh, things in scripture. The Bible's silent and we have to remain silent. Otherwise, we get in trouble if we try to come up with an answer. That reminds me of um, of Kevin's uh, third question when he's wondering about uh, Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Lord told Pharaoh to let his people go to worship him in the wilderness, he wondered, well, if if Pharaoh had done that, uh, would that and then come back afterwards? Mm -hmm. You know, God it seemed had no intention of just you know going out temporarily. Uh, so what do you think would have happened if Pharaoh had let them go temporarily? And the the interesting thing is, you know, the hypotheticals that come up, no one can answer those. Mm -hmm. 
No right. one can answer certain questions. That's right. All right, Sandro, thank you so much for sending your question in. And uh, 888-712-7434 is the number to call in with your Bible question. Any question you have on the Christian faith, uh, give us a call now. 888-712-7434 is the number. Uh, we're going to go back out to the phones. And Jude is on the line from Brooklyn, New York. Jude, are you there? Yes, yes, sir. Praise the Lord. God bless you all. God bless Jesus, you too, Jude. In Jesus' name. Yeah. Um, my question is that um, I did a, I did a teaching um, last year because I went to a church and you have the trees. Santa Claus isn't there. to puts everything inside the church. And uh, apparently the Spirit of God used me to tell them this is not um, the house of God. It's not. Uh, this is not what God expected in his house to put Santa Claus. Yeah, it was Christmas time, but they have Santa Claus. And many churches these days have a tree. It, and, and from my study back, it said is that tree represents a, uh, one of the god of the pagan times. And what do you say about this? Yeah, when it comes to the Christmas tree, Pastor Larry, I know we're still far away from Christmas, but this is also one of those things that becomes uh, an issue to some Christians. Well, it also comes up with too with Easter bunnies and eggs and, and yep. that sort of thing, and Easter egg hunts, and you know how do we how do we get away from mm -hmm. you know what we're trying to communicate to our young people about these very important doctrines in the Bible, the incarnation of the Lord, the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord. You know, the question of Christmas tree comes up, but the argument is this: you know, Santa Claus. I agree. I mean, that seems to be the alternative yeah. to not have to think about Jesus. Right. But a lot of Americans have a tradition about that in their home. And I think that if you're going to have those traditions, you know, gifts in the morning and or elf on a shelf or any of those traditions mm -hmm. that become popular, you know, the reality is if you neglect training your children what Christmas is really all mm -hmm. about, that, that Jesus came to, you know, became one of us. He was born in a manger. So I have a hard, I'd have a hard time with Santa in the church. Um, but typically, you know, many churches put Christmas trees up. Uh, no one's worshiping them. You don't see people coming around them in circles, you know, and singing like, you know, they, they did in the Grinch that stole Christmas, you know. Uh, they're, they're not, there's not a sense of worship. It's really a matter of just a holiday decoration. Um, but the, and the message needs to be clear. So I think you'd have to look, you'd have to kind of balance that out. You know, if if someone is neglecting the things of God in the scriptures for traditions, then you've got a problem. Uh, now, the people that do say something about the Christmas tree, they usually go to Jeremiah 10, how, you know, they they basically had, you know, cut down a tree and decorated it. And they made that same thing look like, oh, see, now they have Christmas trees back then and it was pagan. That was totally different. They were actually making little idols out of the trees, and uh, that's what God had to say against them. So it wasn't a matter of cutting a tree down and decorating it. That They were making idols with that. That's not the same as the American tradition of Christmas trees. So there is definitely a distinction there. Yeah, and the other thing, too, Jude, to keep in mind, and this is the freedom we have in Christ, obviously, as Pastor Lloyd just put it perfectly, is that we're not necessarily worshiping the tree, but Romans 14, verses 5 and 6, you know, Paul sets out the principle in a passage about liberty. He says this, and I quote Paul, one man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. And I think we have to be able to, you know, know that uh, as as a as a family, you know, as, as a dad that I am with my children when it comes to Christmas, you know, we'll put up a Christmas tree. But we kind of sort of like put scripture verses on the tree so that as people come into my house, they'll they love to see the tree and they have you have these different, uh, you know, ornaments and symbols that that kind of preach the gospel in a way. But more than that, I tell my kids, Christmas is not about this tree or anything else. They understand it's about the birth of Christ that we celebrate but we do have the tradition, like you said, Pastor Lloyd. So uh, listen, Jude, we're up to our break. Um, keep uh, Stay on hold. We'll come back to you. And if you have any other questions, we'll be right back. You're listening to Bridge Bible Talk. For your Bible questions and questions on the Christian faith, call now, 888-71-BRIDGE, 888-7434. We'll be right back. When Jesus healed the man born blind, his disciples asked, whose sin was responsible for the blindness? 
This is Jim Garlow. In John 9, Jesus answered the question in this way, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. Rather, the blindness resulted in the works of God being displayed in him. He wasn't sick because God wanted him sick. God ordained a perfect world, but the enemy, Satan, messed up this earth. Eve's sin then messed up this earth, and Adam's followed. Then our sins messed up this world. Jesus emphasized that the healing of the blind man would demonstrate the glory of God. Later on, of course, the crucifixion and subsequent resurrection healed all of us who call Christ Lord. And while that selfless act demonstrates love, mercy, and grace, it was at its root for the glory of God. Praise Him indeed. There's more at JimGarlow.com. Hi, I'm Sean Hyland from Family Policy Alliance of New Jersey. I want to ask you a question. Do you know what is really happening in public schools? Have you heard about the numerous curriculum mandates and learning standards that impose a sexual belief system on students? Do you know what your rights are and what you can do to protect children? I want to encourage you to join me on Sunday, March 28th, 6 p.m. at Calvary Chapel Oak Ridge to learn the facts behind these changes and the latest bills pending in Trenton that threaten your parental rights in education right here in New Jersey. I will answer your questions that night and give you practical steps on how to let your voices be heard. To learn more and register, visit ccob.org. That's ccob.org. So join me March 28th right here at Calvary Chapel Overage. This is Max Lucado. My high school baseball coach had a firm rule against chewing tobacco, and he wanted to draw it to our attention. He got our attention, all right, before long we'd all tried it. It was a sure test of manhood. One day I just popped a plug in my mouth when one of the players warned, here comes a coach. I did what comes naturally. I swallowed gulp. I added new meaning to the scripture. I felt weak deep inside me. I moaned all day long. I paid the price for hiding my disobedience. My body was not made to ingest tobacco. Your soul was not made to ingest sin. Are you keeping any secrets from God, any part of your past or present that you hope you and God never discuss? Well, listen, once you're in the grip of grace, you're free to be honest, and you'll be glad you were. This is Max Lucado. Welcome back to Bridge Bible Talk. Call now with your Bible questions. 888-71-BRIDGE. 888-712-7434. And now, here's your host, Pastor Robert Baltadano. We are back live in studio. 888-712-7434 is the number to call in with your Bible question. Any question you have on the Christian faith. 888-712-7434. Pastor Lloyd Pooley coming to us remotely. I'm in studio, and so we're here to uh, take the next part of the program, the next half, and uh, continue to answer any question you have. 888-712-7434. Uh, real quickly, before we go back to Jude, uh, Pastor Lloyd, uh, Pastor John uh, Durante from Calvary Chapel Point Pleasant Beach is uh, saying hello from uh, Corcha, Albania is where he's at right now. Mm. <laughs> wow. Uh, well, we'll have to pray for him in Albania right now. That's a blessing he got over there, and he's able to minister to the church. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, hello to you, Pastor John, and we'll definitely be praying for you. Uh, I want to go back to Jude. Uh, Jude, we answered your question, and so, uh, you are you know, we just want to make sure that you understood what we said. Well, you know, my belief is, as a minister also, um, is that the house of God, you can't incorporate any other um a tradition or so on and so forth, but when you walk in the house of God, the house of God is the house of God, house of prayer and praise and worship. Uh, right, and, and I think that's one of the things that we were mentioning, Pastor Lloyd, is what we were saying as far as that is, you know, this is tradition, and, uh, you know, to be careful not to split hairs over tradition, um W you know, when you I have think the right heart, what, I'd, I'd like to address the house of God. Yeah. You know, I mean, when we when we address, you know, I I don't go into a church. Um, I speak to the church. In other words, the church is the people of God. The building oftentimes gets associated with the church, and and yes, there is a certain level where you don't want a building that's distracting someone from the worship of mm -hmm. God uh, and putting stumbling blocks in their way. 
But uh, the real church, I, I like seeing the church. Somewhat, sometimes I'm in the empty building, and it's an empty building. Mm-hmm. But when I'm there with the very people of God, what an amazing experience that is when the church is gathered. In fact, when Paul writes to the church at Ephesus or the church at Corinth, he's not writing to the building. He's writing to the gathering of people, which is what church means. It's the ecclesia, those who are called out of the world And uh, we unify because of what Jesus has done uh, through every tribe and nation and tongue. We're brothers and sisters. It's a kind of it's kind of a beautiful picture, a little taste of heaven, just a taste, because one day we'll have a pure freedom in heaven. But it's a taste that we can model to the world how we ought to love one another. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to get caught up on building styles and structure. Uh, Sometimes sometimes people have. Big crosses, sometimes small crosses, but sometimes no crosses, right. but they're preaching the message of the cross. That's another thing. People, when we were doing some redecoration and, and we had a, a cross that was up in one place, we moved it to another, people got upset. Like, why, why are you moving the cross? And I'm like, listen, I want to make it plainly clear here. The symbol of the cross is nothing compared to the message of the cross. That's our message. Amen, amen. Jude, thank you so much for your question. 888-712-7434 is the number to call in with your Bible question. Any question you have on the Christian faith, uh, we do have a question that came in from our YouTube uh Though, uh, Jessica, who's watching on YouTube, Jessica, thank you for sending this question in. And her question is, uh, regarding the Sabbath, do we still have to comply with this commandment, if I'm not mistaken, by reading Jesus Christ is our rest? Uh, so when it comes to the Sabbath, Pastor Lloyd, are we to keep it? Well, the Sabbath, uh, there's a lot of passages on the Sabbath for the Jewish people as a covenant with the Jewish people. and But as a principle and why it's in the Ten Commandments, it is represented as a day of rest to keep it to keep it holy in the sense that unique where God has given this as a gift Jesus made that plainly clear that the Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath it's not so much a law for the people of God to follow as it was as a as a sign for the nation Israel uh, that was very very dear because when they got away from it it was a bad testimony to the world they were a unique people they were to keep that separate Now, when we come to the New Testament, and when Peter writes, he says there does remain a Sabbath for the people of God, but not the, you know, uh, not the, you know, not the constraint that, you know, we are under some law that we've got to, for example, every law has a precept to it. For example, if I were to say, well, I honor the Sabbath, you'd say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, okay, if I'm going to keep the precepts, that means as a Jew, I couldn't walk more than three quarters of a mile. I couldn't light any fire, and they interpret that very strictly now. Even turning your car key is igniting a fire, uh, and you're actually violating the Sabbath. Um, Pushing a button that creates an electrical current is causing a fire, so it's interpreted very strongly in ultra-Orthodox homes. Uh, Ultimately, you find yourself being a slave to the precepts. When Jesus died on the cross, he fulfilled the law. Now, how he does that in... You know, not murdering and not committing adultery. He fulfills it because he forgave us of our sin and then he empowers us to live uh, that life of loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving our neighbor as ourselves. How he fulfilled the Sabbath, of course, is, you know, Joshua was a- unable to bring them into rest, but Hebrews speaks about there's a day of rest that, that Jesus brought us into. So I think you've got a passage handy. Um, you know, Robert, if you want to go ahead and read that passage, but I'm, I'm, I'm quoting them from memory. If you have them on hand, yeah, there's a, a lot of verses that you mentioned. I believe is, uh, you know, First Corinthians. Uh, you know, actually, uh, the the case where Paul brings up more of the freedom that we have in Christ. Uh, Romans eight twenty one, Second Corinthians three seventeen, and Galatians five one. Um, but it's interesting because I think this comes back down to the freedom that we have in Christ, whether we worship on Saturday or Sunday. I mean. For example, Pastor Lloyd, you have a Saturday service, not because you're trying to keep the law, but because you want to have a Saturday service and also a Sunday service. Well, it's just a matter of space for us. I mean, literally, we couldn't fit everybody on Sunday, so we have an extra service on Saturday. And since sometimes people, their Sabbath may not be on Saturday or Sunday. It Mm -hmm. might be a day through the week. Uh, or they, they work on Sundays, but they have another day off. One day in seven is kind of a wise thing to do for your body. 
but it's not a, a commandment in the sense of, you know, if I don't keep this commandment, I'm breaking the law of God. Uh, when I honor what the Lord did uh, in on the cross, I've entered into his rest. And, uh, and that is really the point that is being made. The Sabbath, Colossians 2, verse 8 through 17, basically says, was a shadow of the things to come. Now that we've entered into his rest, we don't need to go back to the shadow. And that's a very important picture to consider, you know, and you mentioned Romans 14, 5, one person esteems one day above another, mm -hmm. another esteems every day alike, each be fully convinced in his own mind. So that's how I would answer that question. All right, Jessica, thank you so much again for sending your question in to, uh, to us here from YouTube. If you're not following us on Facebook, I encourage you to do that right now. Click like on Facebook. Uh, there's a feed going on right now. And also YouTube, it's under the uh, flagship station where Bridge Bible Talk originates from. It's uh, Bridge Radio, which is a YouTube page. Uh, so if you could go there you know, basically subscribe to the YouTube channel and you can hit the little bell that will have you notified when we are live. And so you could do that as well. Uh, but call us in anytime for any question you have, 888-712-7434. We're going to go back out to the phones. We're going to talk to Tom in East Orange, New Jersey. Tom, are you there? Hi, Tom, are you there? Hello? Yes, Tom, you're on the air. Oh, it's not Tom, it's Karen. Oh, okay. I guess <laughs> I had the wrong number. Um, name. Go ahead. Um, yes, I was calling in regards to um, you there? divorce and how it applies. Yeah, um, yeah, okay. it's basically a divorce and how it applies to modern day um, society and everything. You know how the Bible says a man can't really divorce his wife unless he um, kind of finds flaw with her, so forth, and kind of he'd he'd have to like in the Old Testament they'd have to write write a letter back to the parents and everything, mm -hmm. and. Yeah, in society what, today, it's like yeah. everybody just finds flaws for divorcing. And right now, I'm going through a divorce, mm. but oh, there are sorry. no grounds for the, there's no grounds for the divorce. And I'm trying to figure out why, like what what are the biblical terms for it? No, like how how they apply. Yeah. Well, it's much different from uh, our modern day culture today, obviously, right, Pastor Lloyd? Well, yeah, when you go, first of all, when you go back to the Old Testament, um, you can even see, and Jesus acknowledged, you know, when Moses gave them a certificate of divorce or permitted it, it was because of the hardness of their heart. You know, look, all, all divorce is a result of some person's heart being hardened. And because God's intention for marriage is that it would be a vow of commitment, lifelong, uh, between one man and one woman, and intended to be a relationship of love and safety, the husband loving his wife and the wife, you know, respecting her husband. And you have that in Ephesians 5. And, you know, when 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 marriage comes to a place where, look, there's there's difficulty. One thing I've discovered, if couples would learn this one thing, they would they would be amazed in what God could do in their lives. Some couples have uh, intense difficulty getting along and uh, fighting about things and striving with each other and, and and a lot of it is is look when we go into a marriage you know you might you might have entered in as a soulmate um, but then ultimately sometimes you become cellmates and and in a way that's a reality you know you we were the ones that decided to lock ourselves in and commit till death do us part so we we do want to be soulmates but sometimes we are cellmates sometimes we're just sucking it up we're enduring. It's difficult to be with another person 24-7, and it's hard. Well, here's the interesting thing. You know, there's only, you know, God gave this picture of marriage, but obviously if people are unfaithful in a marriage and they violate that covenant by being by committing adultery, um, you know, that certainly was something that he gave as an out. The Old Testament out was essentially the person that committed adultery would be a death penalty and the other person would be free to marry. Uh, in the New Testament, of course, you know, Jesus said, except for unchastity, uh, you're committing adultery. Now, by the time you get to the New Testament uh, letters, Paul also says there's another scenario that when an unbeliever departs, the other, the believer is not under bondage and, and says, if you remarry, you have not sinned. If your un, the unbelieving partner departed and they divorced and, you know, now you want to remain unmarried, but if they get remarried, then you're not under that, that covenant anymore. You're free from that. 
Unfortunately, look, the hardness of heart leads to all manner of uh, pushing people's buttons. And here's the thing I would leave any couple. Uh, studies have shown, the University of Texas did a study of 30,000 people, not even, not even just Christians. This was Christians and non-Christians alike. And they discovered that when marriages who ranked high on the unhappy scale, in other words, they were miserable, fighting, struggling with it, if they were committed to marriage and they stuck it out for five more years, most of them ranked high in the happy scale because they had to work hard at getting along and working it out and, and learning how to get peace and forgive each other. And that does something deep in us. When people that don't want to fight through that give up too easily, uh, they're only going to give up easy, more easy the next time and more easy the next time. And eventually, where will it end? So I highly encourage couples that are having intense difficulty. First of all, get some counseling. You know, get some other people in there that you, you know you can bounce things off of. I, we, my wife and I had a mentoring couple, and one of the things I, I shared uh, early on in our marriage, I said, "Honey, this couple is a great couple. They're godly, and why don't we make a covenant that whenever you have an issue against me that you're not able to get through, you have my permission ahead of time to talk to that woman." and tell on me and rat on me. And, and, and I have the same permission to talk to the guy and then they can talk and they can get together with us. And I'll tell you, that was a nice safety valve because how many, how many husbands tell their wives, you better not say anything about, those, about me to those people at church. <laughs> and it's like they live under torture because they're not really you know, able to talk about it and take that somewhere. And you know, look, the reality is God made it for a relationship. And if we, work, if we fight it out, man, the Lord would really answer. I just shudder and it breaks my heart to think of how many people will never reach the 20 year mark, or the 30 year mark, or as, my, or as my wife and I reach the 40 year mark. That That's heartbreaking because man, when you reach there, you never want to go back to your 20s. You're like, thank you, Lord. This is amazing what you can do in a, in a relationship when you commit and, and it isn't easy. Of course, I often laugh. I say, you know, my wife and I never fight. We just have intense fellowship at times, which is true for everyone. You're going to have those difficulties. Are you uh, seeing? Are you uh, like having anybody counsel you or help you through this? Uh, is it? Uh, what, what was your first? What was your first name again? Sharon. Okay. Uh, yeah, my small groups told me to uh, treat my uh, spouse as an unbeliever, and uh, I'm kind of curious where does that re where uh, the Bible does it, uh, Paul reference that? First Corinthians seven, um, essentially, you know, he this is this is the trouble that happens when. If we would apply Matthew 18, it would make it a lot more clear. In other words, when someone is sinning, you, one person goes to that person, confronts them. If they refuse to listen, two or three witnesses go. And if they still refuse to listen, then you bring it before the elders of the church. And if the elders of the church you know, try to reach that person and say, hey, you need to kind of correct this and go in the right direction, we'll help you. And if they still refuse, then they're to be basically removed from the church, excommunicated. Now, excommunication is never permanent. It's only meant to be remediate, to, to mediate the situation that they can, they're now outside the covering of the church so that, you know, they're going to taste what the wages of Satan is about. And then maybe they'll repent and come back, which is the point. But when an unbelief, when a person is then called, if they, if they still don't listen to the elders, they're counted as a non-believer and they're put out of the church. They're no longer now part of the family of God. And then what happens in a marriage situation, if that person is confronted properly, they're counted as a non-believer. Even if they professed faith, they're technically counted as a non-believer because they are not listening to the discipline and the instruction of the elders. And now they're going to be outside and they have, and if they remarry, they've, they've committed it, the adultery, but that person that's left behind is free to remarry, according to 1 Corinthians 7. Can we pray for you, Karen? Yes. Pastor Lloyd? Lord, you know, we're talking about theology here, and yet we know this has a, a person's lives uh, at stake. And people all around, not just our brother here, but so many, they're experiencing the pain of divorce and how easy people can get uh, distracted with the world and with the easy life and, and maybe meeting somebody else and who's treating them nice and not realizing that if they violate that covenant, they're going to miss so much and it won't end well for them. And Lord, I pray, I pray for our brother that you'd encourage him. 
Uh, I'm not worried about him. I'd be worried about his wife if she's going away from that covenant and he wants to remain unmarried. I pray, Father, that you just help rescue her and bring her to that place of acknowledging you. Uh, Lord, I pray that it would would end in a better way, Lord, for them. But, Lord, we commit this to you and many others that are struggling in these areas. In Jesus' name, mm-hmm. amen. 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 Karen, thank you so much for calling us. And, uh, you know, we pray that uh, the Lord will give you wisdom through this difficult time. And, Pastor Lord, just a question that, you know, is it different from today's culture? I mean, uh, obviously today, it, you know, you have this thing, you know, uh, that people get divorced for, for minor things. And I think you've made this mention before that, uh, basically, people that go into marriage today, not everybody, of course, uh, are going into based on feeling rather than a commitment. Well, we highly recommend people getting premarital counseling. And, you know, you work out a game plan. You you already anticipate there's going to be trouble and you realize it's going to be difficult, which is why you're getting that counseling. You want to be prepared. Uh, there's let's Listen, I, I had my best friend in high school, and we never had nary a hardly ever an argument we always got along greatly so he became my roommate in college and after two weeks we couldn't stand each other Mm -hmm. it's a lot different when you're with living with somebody and that's true especially in marriage because you got two individual sinners now together who who put their best foot forward before they got married and now they're married and they're together all the time and that if that doesn't test your sin nature nothing will so the reality is we should be expecting a lot of challenges. So that's why I say we're soulmates, but we're sometimes cellmates. Mm-hmm. And in that cell, lonely and difficult and painful, sometimes we have a, a newfound strength that we can look to the Lord and ask him to help. And, you know, I never knew how selfish I was until I got married. I thought it was pretty cool, you know, before <laughs> I got married. And I realized, wow, I'm a lot more selfish than I realized. <laughs> Marriage was very helpful to, to reveal some things in my own life. <laughs> yep, I mean it's true. I think we're all. I mean, you got to remember, you got two two imperfect people coming together. So um, you know, nobody's perfect on both ends. You know, it's both sides. Uh, Pastor Lord, we're going to answer one more question before we uh, conclude our program today. Tracy called from Virginia. Uh, she didn't uh, want to go on the air, but her question is this: When you get a gift of money uh, and you give it to a good cause, but should you also tithe with it? So I guess it's in other words, you just give whatever the gift is to this ministry or this cause without tithing to your church. What do you think about that? Well, you know, I, that's an interesting question. I don't really know if there's a precedent that could answer that biblically. Um, I think that would be a matter of a freedom of conscience. Um, you know, biblically, we have the model of, of whatever our increase is, we want to tithe, you know, to honor God with his portion, trusting that he will multiply and and make the nine tenths that we live on, you know, better than the ten tenths if we kept back giving to him. But if if you're endowed with something else, you know, maybe an inheritance or some other gift, and you feel you want to treat that as an as an extra offering, if you're not actually increasing it to yourself, then it's not really your increase. Mm-hmm. It's extra, and you're. I think you're free to, to invest that anywhere you'd want. You know, in the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're if you're adding it to what your increase is, in other words, you're adding it to your portfolio, uh, then obviously you'd want to tithe on that. Right, right, and and I think those are the gray areas that we have in Scripture. Right, you just got to use wisdom, uh, you know, from the Lord as far as what to do, but not to take it to the place where you feel kind of obligated to do something that perhaps. You know, you don't need to do that. The Bible doesn't show. But, you know, aside from what you said. Well, and that's something that Paul talks about giving. You know, and he, he says, look, I, there's not supposed to be a, an, a begrudging obligation mm-hmm. in these things. If, you, if people begrudge and they feel obligated to, oh, I've got to give this, you know, because somebody knows I got this inheritance and now I'm going to look bad mm-hmm. if I don't. And you grudgingly give. The Lord would rather have you keep it than give it yeah. grudgingly. You know, it's it's he wants you to give it freely and, and generously and hilariously, actually, is a version, you know, with with a great joy. And it should be an overflow. Uh, it should not be a begrudging obligation. That's right. All right. Uh, so that's pretty much all the time that we're going to have to take any questions. And so tomorrow we're going to be back live again, same time, same station. Pastor Lloyd, uh, any final encouraging thoughts, uh, anything you want to say to uh, our listeners? 
You know, listen, keep keep praying that God will give us wisdom as uh, leaders in the church to navigate these times. Pray for pastors. Uh, there are there are some things coming down the pike that are going to really be um, a strong statement against, you know, a biblical teaching. And there are going to be many people tempted to compromise from the Bible, tempted to soften it, tempted to say, well, you know, God understands. And, you know, listen, already people play fast and loose with the scriptures and, and they're missing out. They're, they're actually cutting off their own nose to spite their face. They're missing so much of what God could do. And I love the fact that people are calling with questions. It tells me they're reading the Bible. We need more Bible, not less, in our current culture. And uh, we need to be able to answer some of these attacks against the scriptures. And some people are asking questions because I can tell you they've been they've been challenged by somebody at work. You know, well, what about this? Mocking this truth of the Bible, mocking that truth. And so the more familiar you are with the whole Bible, the better it will be for you, the better it will be for others around you. And right now, the world needs a shining light because there's great darkness ahead and we need stronger Christians grounded Christians, not fluffy, frothy, you know, feel-good Christians. That is so true, especially with the movement of what we call progressive Christianity, which is the opposite of the historical Christian faith. So you really need to know your Bible, be prayed up, and uh, shine the light, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. So that concludes our program today. Just want to thank you for joining us for the hour, and uh, we're going to be back.